1230 Pacific Time. Uh, this is Sophia Chang from the California Healthcare Foundation, uh, um, welcoming you to the California Improvement monthly webinar series. I am um, just going to go through a little bit of etiquette here. This is indeed the webinar talking about Spirometry 360. It's got a catchy little title, Breathing Easier in Order to Improve Asthma and COPD Diagnosis and Management. Sorry, I'm trying to get my desktop to clear up here. Um, we are going to be recording this session, and it will be posted on our website within the week after the call. I'll be giving you the URL and site for that at the end. Uh, to reduce distractions and background noise, there's some basic etiquette points that I'm going to go through about um, being on a webinar, but I think uh, given the number of folks that we have on the call already, I'm going to go ahead and mute everyone up front. But in general, whenever you're on one of these uh, group calls, please remember to send them to your calls to voicemail, silence your ringers, be careful of background noise, and uh, never, never use hold. <laughs> I think we've all been on too many calls where we've been able to hear everyone else's music, um, unfortunately for the rest of the folks on the, on the line. So to ask a question during the session, and the speakers said they're quite comfortable having people ask questions as they speak, so you should feel free. Um, when you ask a question to the speaker, please use the chat function at the bottom right-hand side of your screen, and where it says send to, send it to all participants. That way people um, can all see what the questions are that are being posed. Um, if you have a logistics question, you can chat to the host and um, my assistant, Kanell, who's also shown as Sarah Aiden here, uh, will be happy to help you. Now, uh, if you want to actually uh, pose your question in person verbally, you can raise your hand and you do that by uh, clicking on that little uh, hand icon that should be right above your chat box, um, and uh, when you raise your hand, I'm able to acknowledge you and unmute you to, to, uh, to pose your questions. So let me briefly talk about today's speakers and so we can get on with the actual show here. We are going to be hearing from two primary speakers, Dr. Jim Stout and Greg, uh, Dr. Gre Jim Stout and Greg Ledgerwood. Uh, Dr. James Stout is a professor of pediatrics and an adjunct professor of health services at the University of Washington. He's a co-founder of the National Initiative for Children's Healthcare Quality, otherwise known as NICHQ, which is a nonprofit organization headquartered in Boston. He's a pediatrician with the Odessa Brown Children's Clinic, which is a satellite of Seattle Children's Hospital, where he directs their asthma clinic and provides direction for its quality improvement programs. Through these organizations, he's really worked on a variety of local and national projects with the unified goal of improving the quality of children's health care. He's a real leader in this area. Dr. Stad attended Roanoke College, where he received a master's in science, uh, re then received a master's in science and math education from Duke, prior to attending Wake Forest University Medical School. He's rounded off his degrees with an MPH from the University of Washington. At UW, he leads the Interactive Medical Training Resources Group, which is the source of a lot of what you're going to be hearing about today, which develops, evaluates, and disseminates online resources for remote training and feedback. And as you'll see, their current focus is on spirometry. He works on local, national, and international projects with the common aim of improving the quality of healthcare. Dr. Greg Ledgerwood is a board-certified family practice physician who has practiced in rural eastern Washington for over 30 years. He's truly a man of the trenches. He's the head of allergy at Brewster Medical Center in Brewster, Washington, where he practices in allergy and family medicine. He's been a national lecturer for the American Academy of Family Physicians on a variety of allergy-related subjects and is on a number of national advisory boards dealing with chronic respiratory diseases and allergy. 
Dr. Ledgerwood attended Washington State University for his undergraduate degree, then the University of Washington School of Medicine. He did his postgraduate training at Kaiser Permanente in San Francisco. We had to have some California link here. Uh, he was the head of family practice and allergy as part of his stint in the U.S. Air Force. And in addition to his clinical practice, he has held roles in coordinating residency training programs in family practice. And so I am going to move us along here and um, let Dr. Stout speak. Okay. Thanks for that nice introduction, Sophia. It's, um, first of all, I just want to thank you for the opportunity to um, share our program with those of you on the call. Um, and to California Healthcare Foundation for um, its support of our work. Um, next slide, Sophia, um, shows part of our gang. Um, uh, I'm in the upper left-hand corner. To my right is uh, Mr. Dennis Burgess, who is our um, software engineer and is responsible for the, um, the software systems I'll explain to you a bit further. Um, uh, immediately underneath Dennis is Bonnie Rains, who is actually just returned from maternity leave after um, having her second daughter, and she is our kind of organizing force. Uh, Dr. Karen Smith um, beneath me is our medical director and oversees all of the clinical content of our programs and, and guides our faculty in our, our internal process, basically. Um, the next two folks are um, Drew Martinson, who is a respiratory therapist, and he overreads um, curves by the thousands, tests by the thousands, and gives comments on them. Um, increasingly, he's become one of our teaching faculty on webinars and um, has become sort of an expert in, in what we call Drew Care, where um, he'll spend an hour screen sharing or whatever it takes on the, on the phone with a practice who is having some technical issues and sort of help them through those barriers. And finally, uh, last but certainly not least, Ben Hedrick is our program assistant and research coordinator. Um, and while Bonnie was on maternity leave, he assumed many of her duties and he's just a, um, a very can-do guy and is often the face of our program to the practices we support um, through it. Um, okay, next slide. So our objectives today, um, you've, I basically just went over who we are. I'll give you a little bit more background in the next slide. Um, I want to make the case for why bother in the first place, why, why you need spirometry training, describe our program, um, show you some results, and then really get into the weeds a little bit and talk about the roles and expectations of practices and of ourselves. Um, and, and potentially have a network leadership if they get if there's a network involved, um, and then just consideration of next steps. And we hope to do all this um, by quarter till um, the end of the hour, so that we save plenty of room for questions and discussions if there is. So um, anyway, that's that's our goal is to get through the content um, soon enough to have a good open-ended conversation. So next slide, Sophia. So we are. Uh, our group is based at the University of Washington, and we have uh, members of the departments of pediatrics, uh, myself and, and Karen and our, our staff, internal medicine at the U, and also uh, uh, the health services department here. We were quote unquote founded, meaning we, there wasn't a day on which we said, you know, we are hereby founded, but in 2006 we first began to develop and disseminate and, and evaluate um, these media rich tools that we'll be explaining to you. And um, for lack of a better term, we have two product lines. One, the Spirometry 360 program and its related um, sort of technical supports and resources. Um, a second program, uh, which we started uh, a couple of years ago and we're just now piloting at our own children's hospital is procedural pediatric sedation. And this is basically uh, how to safely and effectively sedate kids um, that are having painful things done outside of the operating room. So kids in the emergency room or kids needing a bone marrow, that sort of thing. Um, and it's a very good tool and it will be a completely different audience, I think, than um, our spirometry work. Um, next slide, Sophia. So just to, to begin framing this issue a bit, um, in the United States, uh, roughly half of primary care offices report using spirometry, um, at, at least for kids. It's probably a little bit higher than that for adults. 
it enables accurate diagnosis and management of asthma and COPD and less common conditions. Um, management, really, once you have uh, a patient identified as having either asthma or COPD, any specialist will say that the real value of this tool is in ongoing management. So you can see both response to medication or improvement or deterioration in lung function that often uh, manifest before your patient feels any differently or, or, or any other um, manifestations happen. It's able to identify patients with obstruction not otherwise identified with your stethoscope or with a good, careful, structured history. Um, it really does fill a gap that's missing, um, particularly in folks that are not particularly good perceivers of their obstruction, which includes many with both asthma and COPD. Um, the maneuver is technique dependent. It's easy to do poorly, but not hard to do well. Um, I often compare it to a musical instrument or learning to play a sport. It's a, it's a set of psychomotor skills that you actually need to be able to um, teach your patient how to do. So it's, it's actually learning that technique and then once removed. Um, and it's a very potent leverage tool for improving chronic care and uh, ultimately, I think, reducing morbidity and, and lowering hospitalization and ED rates. And uh, a few slides later, I can tell you about a study along those lines. Um, the, before I leave that last point, the, the, what people quickly learn when they start doing spirometry is that it serves as sort of a focal point for introducing um, a system of planned visits for either asthma or COPD um, and becomes one of your vital signs in that setting because you really need to check a patient when they're not sick, when they're um, at, their ba at their baseline, basically. Okay, Sophia, next slide. Um, the big barriers um, for those of us in, in primary care offices are lack of training and support uh, for support staff and providers, um, lack of a device, of course, or, you know, many offices sort of have a device that's sitting up on a shelf somewhere and uh, someone had the idea to give it a try um, some years ago and realized that there are indeed some technical barriers and some issues of interpretation. Um, and so it just went on a shelf and sort of in the too hard box. And then finally, lack of time, just, you know, who isn't as busy as they would like to be in primary care these days? And you really do have to configure things a bit differently in order to sort of capture this information in a way that doesn't impede your patient flow. And Greg's going to have more to say about that um, a little bit later in the talk. Um, next slide, Sophia. So some reasons to do uh, spirometry, and, and I uh, feel kind of this is a, an, an unusual format for us because normally um, when we do the learning labs, which I'll describe to you, they're quite interactive, and this is one of the things that we typically ask people to chat in th um, their reasons, but in the interest of time, I just wanted to put up some common reasons, um, that being diagnosis and severity assessment of asthma, um, following asthma control, especially when making a medication change. Um, diagnosis and severity uh, assessment of COPD, and as Greg will mention, it's, a, it's really an integral part of that initial diagnosis of COPD. Um, chronic bronchitis or chronic cough, um, a, a sort of long-term smoker, and shortness of breath or just other respiratory complaints, perhaps um, exercise-induced bronchospasm, and you want to know where, how that patient is doing at baseline. Um, and I'm sure if we gave you the chance, you could, ch you could chat in other reasons as well. But really it's once, again, I mean, just to sort of make the, the most important point is once you've identified a patient with one of these conditions, following them along um, preventively is, is, is the great value of this procedure. <clears throat> Next slide. Um, <clears throat> this is um, from a pediatric office uh, a couple of years ago now. Um, you know, and I, I, I'd like to actually just stop and praise the, um, you know, the medical assistant or nurse who tried to get the patient to do this maneuver because they tried three times, three times ineffectively, perhaps the tongue was in the way of the mouthpiece or um, a finger was, you know, over the sort of many technique problems could result in this curve, but this curve is worthless. And, um, you know, a worst case situation is when you produce a curve like this and you say, oh my goodness, I have no idea what this is, refer the patient to a pulmonologist for extra time and money, and in good hands when the procedure is done, lo and behold, it's, it's actually, everything looks fine. So I think that's sort of the, the worst, po you know, the worst possible outcome, I think, is just misuse of this procedure or not um, being aware when you've, you've got a test that you really can't do anything with. Um, next slide. 
our mission, uh, the mission of our group is to improve the care delivered in general practice to patients with asthma and COPD, to find them and then preventively manage them. We focus initially on properly performing spirometry, um, again, with a focus on uh, introducing uh, a system of planned care. And uh, over the course of our existence, we've been doing this since early 2009, we've sought ways to uh, reach, hard to reach uh, groups of practices, um, those caring for safety net populations where the burden of asthma and COPD is the greatest. Um, and I think one of the things that we do best is make our training available uh, to practices that would otherwise find it impossible to just, you know, basically shutter their practice for a day and go off to a training a day or more, um, or for whatever reason, uh, travel away is, is just not possible. So we do um, completely eliminate that um, component of getting trained and, and do everything we do online. Um, next slide. So our activities uh, begin with recruiting and pre-screening um, and then ultimately enrolling practices, making sure they know what they're getting into, and um, hopefully this call will uh, pretty much um, demystify that process. We ask a practice to put together a team, um, including uh, not more than three uh, coaches, meaning the people coaching patients to do the test, and providers, those that will be interpreting its output. And then the training begins um, with the Spirometry Fundamentals tutorial. We'll show you a screenshot of that in a second. Um, and then the Learning Lab webinar series, which, which Greg will describe shortly. And then the feedback begins um, with a baseline report. And this, this involves basically a census of tests, meaning all of your tests from the baseline period um, um, that we overread and sort of compile into a feedback report that goes back to your practice. And then ha that happens again for three monthly follow-up reports. Um, for those practices that are having trouble with either frequency of the test or, or uh, technique quality, we, again, offer one-on-one -on -one support um, wherever it's needed and desired. Um, that sort of has to, you know, not only, a practice has to not only um, need it based on their results, but also want it. And we certainly don't force that on anyone, but um, we've had great success when, when people have taken us up on that. Um, uh, Karen Smith, not on the call, um, our medical director is working with a, a group of low-performing practices at the end of the Spirometry 360 course and um, has really uh, broken trail in figuring out what these practices need. The, um, what we're learning is, is that problems break down into two, um, which is really no mystery. One is uh, problems with technique, and then the other is problems uh, with just integrating the, the, um, the procedure into the flow of care so that it's uh, available at the start of a visit as one of your vital signs for, for patients with respiratory issues. Um, the next slide is just a quick overview. It looks, this is a very confusing slide, but um, it just gives you a, a quick overview of our timeline. Um, this would be for our spring course. Um, and uh, basically uh, involves completing a license agreement with our tech transfer office, receiving a welcome packet. Um, uh, then you join a welcome session, which in part is to learn about how to use WebEx um, in interactively. And then you begin collecting baseline data. Um, we then circulate spirometry fundamentals, which uh, goes out to practices as an online login, and it's meant not for, it's meant basically for anyone in the practice that wants to use it, and, and we don't restrict its use to one person or even just the subgroup that are actively involved in the project, but it's meant as a, a resource to be shared amongst your, uh, your practice colleagues. And then the learning labs occur. We'll talk about those in a minute. There are 90-minute sessions, and there's four of them. Two are focused on coaching the maneuver. One is on interpretation, and the final one we call putting it all together, where we get into the sort of the nitty gritty of um, some of the, the quality improvement issues around, around uh, making this happen. For feedback, um, we initially make sure that uploading works, and then we upload your data for real for the, um, basically the period of the course, which runs um, basically through Memorial Day. Um, and then you receive feedback reports approximately two weeks after the, the close of the month. And as I mentioned, um, additional coaching is necessary. We found to be increasingly useful for practices that, that are hitting barriers. Um, next slide. This is a screenshot of spirometry fundamentals, and I just quickly want to tell you 
um, how the course evolved because this was the first thing we produced and um, we, we basically began putting it out in the world in 2006. And what we did almost right away was uh, through funding from the American Thoracic Society, a randomized trial of this tool to see if it was enough to improve the quality of uh, spirometry in primary care settings. It was uh, 40 practices, um, half of which got the CD-ROM at that point, the other half which got nothing. And what we had was a resoundingly um, negative finding, a real um, <laughs> um, strong statement that this was not enough um, of an intervention. However, we heard back from folks that they thought the tool was great, but it just wasn't enough. They needed um, case-based practice with, with experts in, in real time, and they also needed someone to tell them about the, the quality of the technique of the maneuver. Um, that, so it was that, that feedback, really, that inspired the full project that we'll tell you about now. Um, in this next slide, I'll turn you over um, to my friend and colleague, Greg Ledgerwood, on the left, and he'll tell you a bit about the Family Practice uh, Learning Lab. Um, and his colleague, uh, Bruce Culver, is a professor of medicine, also sits on the American Thoracic Society Pulmonary Function Standards Committee, so he's a kind of a ringer for us, um, and has been hugely helpful in just sort of figuring out our um, grading algorithms and such. Um, and anyway, Greg, I'll turn it over to you now uh, for the next few slides. Great, Jim. Thanks a lot. And welcome, everyone, for uh, a couple of slides that I'll present. Could we have the next slide, Sophia, please? So I'm just going to basically go over what our objectives are uh, in the learning labs. Uh, as Jim referred to, we have four sessions, uh, two of them directed for coaches and two of them for coaches and uh, the people that are going to interpret the test. And it's uh, incredibly uh, interactive. Obviously, most of the stuff we see in primary care is uh, related to obstruction, as, of course, uh, we see with asthma and COPD. And occasionally, we see restrictive patterns. And we have uh, several slides in our course that talk about, you know, if you recognize this uh, and certainly how to recognize it, what you should do with these patterns as far as referral. We also uh, I think it's important to list the criteria for use of spirometry in the diagnosis and treatment of all uh, respiratory conditions, and we don't have time to discuss all of those, but I think probably the most common is to recognize and diagnose common obstructive lung conditions that we see in primary care. We want everybody at the end of the sessions to be able to read a pre- and post-bronchodilator test and identify particularly when a special referral is advisable based on what you find uh, on spirometry in your office. Again, office-based spirometry is important in the sense that we can use that plus the patient's background and our personal knowledge of the patient to improve our patient care. And then last but not least is to incorporate spirometry into a plan and preventative visit system, as Jim's alluded to previously. Next slide, please, Sophia. So this is a patient, actually, of mine that just sort of whet, whet your appetite and give you an idea how we how we run some of our uh, provider sessions. Uh, actually, I believe this was for both provider and coaching. And we actually have polling questions, and everybody and will be encouraged to chime in on the, the correct answers uh, as far as what you think this spirometry might uh, represent. And I, uh, I understand that uh, some of you on the line today have done spirometry and some have not, but what, I've, what we have here is basically a uh, before and after a uh, spirogram that shows uh, this uh, breathing test on a 77-year-old male, and uh, we have his vital signs, height, and weight. And then we do uh, what's so-called in the green here, the post after a, a bronchodilator has been provided for the patient. And we talk about curve recognition both here and here. We talk about uh, specifically volume time curves and the importance of that. And then we look at the numbers over here in this column, both pre and post. And I'm not going to get into that in this kind of a session, but we teach uh, what the curves mean from a visual standpoint, and then we confirm that by looking at these values here, both in the pre and post. So I won't ask you to obviously uh, chime in on this, but we go over what the ATS criteria is for a positive bronchodilator response. And if there's a question about that when we're done, we'll come back to it. Next slide, please. I think this is yours, Jim. Yeah, I think it's back to me, Greg. So that's just a little um, taste of what Greg and Bruce lead the uh, family slash internal medicine track through, um, focusing kind of equally on asthma and COPD diagnosis and management. 
Um, and then the third component is the feedback reporting. Um, as I m I've mentioned already, uh, this is, I, we sort of think of it as kind of the secret sauce. It's really um, what enables practices to, to get the test right, which of course um, then enables everything else to happen, meaning an appropriate diagnosis, an appropriate management decision, and a healthier patient. Um, these, the overreading and feedback activities from our perspective represent about three quarters of the work that we do in delivering um, the program. Four different people touch these reports for different reasons, and each one of them is sort of uh, um, custom uh, built, if you will, for that particular practice and their particular situation. Um, next slide, Sophia. We um, we kind of call these the the. The, the Q by Q is what Dr. Smith likes to call these, the quantity and quality of tests. The, our two benchmarks are how frequently the test is done in primary care. Um, we've learned over the years that if a practice is doing 10 or more tests per month, then they can refine this procedure appropriately. Um, and most practices uh, meet this measure, um, family practices more commonly so than pediatric practices. Um, and then the quality of the test performance our other measure, and really the, the most important thing we do, I think, and our benchmark is to get at least 60% passing tests. Um, and three quarters of our practices make that. Remember, that's sort of um, a summary score. And uh, what we really look for, I think, for a practice to feel unequivocally like they, are, they have their arms around this is 70% um, or better passing. And <clears throat> um, the majority of our practices are able to make that benchmark as well. Um, next slide. So these are, <clears throat> there are two really um, interesting stories just to sort of give you snapshots of how this works. And both of these are kind of, um, not, worst case scenario is the wrong thing to call them, but really challenging practices with really challenging situations. Um, this first practice, the urban, um, both of them uh, basically gave us permission to use their names. And um, those on the phone, some of you may be familiar with the St. Anthony's uh, free clinic program um, in the Tenderloin neighborhood of San Francisco. Um, that's this practice. And they failed, actually, several attempts to uh, jumpstart use of spirometry in their practice, um, trying to train all of their nine support staff, um, but then providing no training to their providers in how to interpret the test. Um, they have lots of just naturally occurring barriers because of the, um, the patient population they serve. Um, very high risk patients with chaotic lives, high illness burden, um, and often just don't make it to specialty care. What they did have was a pair of very motivated providers to take this on, and our first task really was to convince them to just let us train the two or three um, focus support staff and the two motivated docs and create a core team um, to, to basically go at it. And the final result for them was a pass rate of 85%. Um, so they really became almost like a, a poster child in the San Francisco community um, and, and basically now like to tell other practices that if we can do this, you can too, you know, given what they were up against. And they serve as a spirometry hub now in San Francisco for other safety net practices, not yet doing the procedure, but they can refer to St. Anthony's just to get the test done and then work in, in conjunction with UCSF and San Francisco General um, for interpretation. So they've really gone on to be a model of care. Um, this rural practice in eastern Washington is the Klickitat uh, Valley Health Family Practice and uh, a safety net practice, brand new to spirometry, um, felt like they had an urgent need to serve a high-risk population, and were actually a pretty low performer early on. In the last month of the program, um, they sent a, an astounding number of tests, 92 tests, and had a 68% pass rate. Um, so they still have quite a way to go, but they were able to basically, um, you know, train in this very remote location, um, a practice completely new to the test, and get to a respectable um, level of passing. When they began, they were at about a 40% pass rate. So um, they really have ramped this up to fill a huge unmet need in their community and really allowing for the first time universal access to this test for their patient. Um, so those are just two examples of uh, practices that have really um, overcome barriers in order to um, integrate this procedure into their care, and I think wouldn't do it another way at this point. Um, next slide, Sophia. Okay, quickly about the, the reporting system. Um, let's go to the next slide. Uh, this is an example of a summary report. This summarizes our activity from the fall course. I think we had 
um, somewhere around 23, 24 practices in this group. Um, and this column here shows the group average from each month. This is the, September was our baseline month, and then the training began in October, um, went into November, and then December was the final month of the course. And up here you can see the per practice uh, curve rate, both frequency, um, I'm sorry, the number passing and then the total number of, of tests. These pie charts take a while, at least they did for me, to kind of figure out, but basically green, blue, and yellow are passing tests, are clinically useful, and you can just sort of see it as those uh, colors on the wheel um, increase over the, um, the course of the, the months. And this is the actual breakdown, the number of tests with A grades um, rolled up for the entire practice group, et cetera, um, baseline followed by um, the, the peak here for A grades was um, in the month of November. And the next slide shows the same information in run chart form. So this was the change in volume, not really a, a staggering increase in volume, but we started out at about 10 tests per month and, and finished at about 16. Um, and then the quality um, started right at about 50%, um, peaked in uh, no, the month of November, um, just over 70%, and then drifted down a little bit. We frequently see this in the last month of training. It's interesting. We, in the fall when we do this course, the, this uh, represents the entire month of December. So, of course, that includes the, the Christmas, New Year's holiday. Um, so it, it appears to kind of, it's a shorter than average month in that regard. And interestingly, when we do it in the spring, this is, this represents May, um, and that last triangle is basically Memorial Day. And again, when things warm up, um, people kind of quit thinking about asthma, and I don't know about COPD, but certainly in pediatrics, people think about asthma less, um, and you kind of move into your summer um, sports injury um, phase of practice, if you will. Um, those of you that have been in primary care for a while know there are seasons for, um, you know, for different problems. Um, next slide. Again, just shows uh, another example of a run chart. Um, this is an individual run chart where um, this is back from 2009, but just to show you a, an individual practice um, compared to um, the summary from that particular course. And um, in this case, you can see once training started for this practice, they just they they got it and they, you know, really responded nicely to the training. And most practices do have a curve that looks, looks something like this. Um, there are always a few that don't really catch on immediately, and some of those have just decided um, it's now is not the right time to take this on, and others just need a bit of extra help. And um, you know, those tend to sort themselves out pretty simply as we go through. Um, next slide. So expectations and roles of us, um, we uh, assist and screen with enrollment of, of practices. We deliver the course and report results, and we assist low performers um, in any way we can um, via, you know, distance uh, learning technologies. Practices, we expect them to provide four months of tests and to view spirometry fundamentals as the sort of the required reading, if you will, for the, um, for the course. Um, and although, you know, as a standalone intervention it didn't work, it's, it's actually a, a very critical piece of the training and we now know that people that take the course without viewing spirometry fundamentals don't do as well as those that do. Um, attend the rele rele uh, relevant learning labs and review feedback reports as a team. Um, next slide. Um, <clears throat> what you can expect is our, basically the three components of training and feedback. Um, built on evidence that we've accrued over the years, as well as quality improvement principles. Um, we offer CME credit and maintenance of certification <clears throat> part four credit. Um, those of you that um, are in the recertification part of your career, um, this is a way to take care of that measurement of practice component. Um, we offer a certificate of completion, and um, we basically just uh, help you to use high quality spirometry in your routine care. Um, next slide. So uh, each team should uh, select a team champion who can schedule the team to meet monthly and this really, it, the other sort of principles this brings to bear are sort of the, um, the, the components of a medical home and just building a, a system of preventive care. Um, assist your team in discussing the spirometry improvement project, set goals, and, and you know, we help you measure your progress and um, ensure uh, that the time and resources um, are available to help, to help you. Um, and also this team can help facilitate spread of successful changes throughout the rest of your practice. 
Um, next slide. Um, the team roles and responsibilities, again, this is kind of review at this point, but are to view spirometry fundamentals, attend the learning labs, and participate in the case-based practice, um, meet at least monthly to review the feedback reports, review successes and your barriers and challenges, uh, decide how to make your next incremental quality improvement change around the plan, do, study, act cycle that I suspect many of you are familiar with and has been sort of a, a standard of our work. Uh, since um, the 90s when we founded NICHQ. Um, next slide. Um, Craig, is this to you? I, I think it is. is. Jim. Yeah, thank you. Okay. So, uh, again, and, uh, just talking about chronic care and, uh, with asthma visits, uh, and, and we could say the same thing about COPD for that matter, but I, I think with the EPR3 guidelines that were published in 07, it's important to at least have an established plan asthma care. And we're all going to be faced with this fact that we're going to have to start measuring uh, what we do with patients and whether or not we're keeping them in or out of uh, emergency rooms and hospitals. And part of what this course does is, is emphasize that. But again, we gain efficiencies by working as a team. We delegate jobs and roles, and I think that's very important. I think you need to be able to set up uh, a planned visit and have uh, your team, that is your MA or nurse and or your receptionist, uh, delegate responsibilities when that patient first comes in, uh, set up a program such that there is not a waste of time in that patient's uh, visit so that you can get these studies done and also not to waste your time. Uh, define and use an asthma-centric space. Uh, sometimes that's possible, sometimes it isn't, but easily worked around. Uh, restructuring the workflow if needed, I think that's important and again, I hear this all the time that these are barriers that people surmise that might be uh, pot, uh, uh, something that they would run into from time to time. But they, if you work with the system and plan the system, uh, actually you'll see that your your work product actually improves. And then, of course, trying to use a standard encounter form to assist quick and thorough documentation. With EMR now, I think that most of the people that are using electronic medical records, that uh, we are seeing that done. Next slide, please, Sophia. So in adults and seniors, just a couple of things, and again, we won't, we'll just whet your appetite, but we spend some time talking about spirometry in adult and seniors, particularly people over the age of 70. You want to make sure you know what your patient's medicines are, what they're taking, and how that might actually impact whether or not you do spirometry standing or sitting. We don't encourage nose clips, as the, one of the slides that Jim showed uh, uh, demonstrates. Uh, we don't think that's necessary as far as uh, outpatient spirometry, but if you're comfortable doing so, that's fine. Most people don't like them. Uh, again, remember that spirometry is a Valsalva-like maneuver and can cause syncope. And then also remember that particularly in people with stage 2 or stage 3 COPD or poorly controlled will often cough with the maximum expiratory effort. And it's also important to realize that when somebody comes in that's ill or not controlled, that you really are wasting their time and your effort in trying to do spirometry. So you really make, sh make sure that if the patient cannot tolerate the spirogram, uh, if they're dizzy or they're coughing or they're running out of air, or again, they just don't look healthy enough to do it that day, just terminate it and, and report it in the chart notes and try to set up another scheduled visit. Next slide, please. So in COPD, it's interesting. In fact, uh, Karen Smith uh, just sent uh, all of us on the faculty an article that, that uh, was published or is to be published in the Journal of International uh, Chronic Obstructive Lung Disease, uh, and it demonstrates that under the guidelines that have been published for the GOLD guidelines, that we really are not doing a good job uh, if you're not doing spirometry. Of, uh, of course, the American College of Physicians guidelines were published in 2011, uh, that any patients that have suggestive COPD need to have uh, spirometry uh, to confirm. And right now, uh, the vast majority of people that get admitted to the hospital with a severe COPD exacerbation, greater than 60% of them have never been told they had COPD before. So we're not doing a very good job about looking at and or screening patients. Now, that doesn't mean to say that we should screen everyone. In fact, uh, we now know that it's, it's not a process that is even recognized nor recommended, nor probably even paid for by many uh, third-party payers as a screening tool. But if somebody has a smoking history, particularly somebody with a 20-pack year history, 
uh, and then uh, has a cough or shortness of breath, obviously it should be done remembering that you want to do bronchodilator testing with these patients as well. Because remember, people with COPD that we define as being obstruction and not reversible, most of them will have some reversibility. Next slide, please. So again, the track as far as the family practice track is concerned and, and uh, the dates for our next class are pending at this point. I think they're pretty much cast in stone, but the first one starts out with a, a coach learning lab and we go over the techniques uh, and uh, Drew has done an excellent job in the defining what is important. Uh, there is a give and take session with that and a lot of interaction on how to uh, do the spirometry exam. Remember, the quality of the examination is only as good as the frequency and the coaches that are doing it. And then we start off with the provider learning lab number one in which uh, myself and Bruce Culver uh, present uh, talking about spirograms and what the uh, pitfalls of some of the spirograms interpretation. And again, I showed you previously that one uh, multiple choice question. We talk about that and we uh, then uh, use those uh, kinds of uh, slides to engage the audience in question and answers. Uh, we follow that up with a, a second uh, learning lab, again, talking about more, some of the more unusual uh, findings that you'll do and see in spirometry. And that, last but not least, is a combined provider coach learning lab. That's our sort of the last finale from the standpoint of online learning, although, of course, there is a continuation of sending in and overreading the spirograms. So, Jim, I'll turn it back over to you now. Thanks, Greg. Um, Sophia, if you don't mind backing up just for a second, <clears throat> um, I should have updated this slide before this talk. We just have finalized these dates, and you can actually get the flyer for the next course, which will be in fall at this website, um, spirometrytraining.org. Um, there's a little uh, box at the top of the homepage that um, takes you to our flyer for the fall course and has the um, dates and times um, posted there. Okay, next slide. Um, we get tests two different ways. We've trained close to 300 practices now since 2009, and probably 100 or so of them have sent us uh, paper tests through the U.S. mail. Um, this is sort of a, a, a cumbersome, potentially error-prone method, but it works, and we're now confident in using it, it's just a, it's kind of more work on the practices end, and also significantly more work on, on our end, just to <clears throat> to get the feedback this way. But um, we've got a good system down now. We send mailers out to practices and ask people to redact the name and date of birth for um, every um, spirometry printout they send to us. We then scan it into our feedback reporting system, and it joins the data set that way, and the, um, the feedback um, comes back in the same way. Um, we can't quite do as much with these data as with the, um, the next system I'll show you. But um, basically, we, we have these t tests sent to us um, twice a month um, and, uh, again, roll them up into the feedback report. The next slide um, shows how the system works with one device currently, the NDD Easy One, um, which is a handheld device. This, this is uh, um, there's a lot of uh, things we could I could say about the spirometer. Um, it's we currently are interfaced only with this device's software, um, which was simply um, a matter of uh, where we are in our own development and 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 the resources it takes to build this interface. But what we're able to do with this machine um, is when you, the user, dock this machine and uh, um, the data goes into your um, into your laptop or desktop, it automatically uploads to us de-identified tests from your patients, so you don't have to do anything um, related to data collection. And um, we basically get it into our database. <clears throat> it goes into the spirometry web portal, and then and then we do the overreading and feedback. A feature that's new just this year um, that that matters a lot uh, for practices, actually, regardless of how um, they send us their test, is that you can now go into um, the, the feedback reporting system and look at your test file and look at individual results. And, um, you know, a subset of practices every time we do this course wants that level of detail, and we're now um, happy to provide it. And I think for the right practices, that'll be um, extremely useful. Um, next slide. So if you choose to join us, um, I, I think the enrollment timeline to be aware of is our, uh, we have a, um, early registration that cuts off in early uh, July 
this year, and then um, see, I think it's either late July or, or, or early August for the the final deadline. Um, that's for the course that begins in um, August and September. Um, a practice should have a sufficient volume of patients to test to warrant training, meaning that you know you could comfortably um, imagine training ten patients or more in a month. Um, it does require a commitment from from you and your your staff, um, and just basically the the willingness to learn this new procedure and 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 to put a bit of skin in the game. You need a spirometer, of course, and you need a good internet connection uh, to do the training. Um, next slide. What you can expect is uh, very focused attention to your practice by our team. Um, you can expect more spirometry done in your practices for COPD and asthma, and that it's done uh, with higher quality. Um, providers really like this course. We get uh, very high marks in terms of people's satisfaction with the training, and pretty much, basically 100% of people say they would recommend the training to a colleague, and I think many have done that. Um, and it also helps you improve your process of chronic care delivery around these very common respiratory problems. Um, next slide. And that's it. And we look at that. We did it. It's quarter after. You did. And I am going to ask, uh, Canel, if you can unmute Patty. Patty Porter from the Partnership Health Plan um, is on the line. And, and actually, they were the group that brought Spirometry 360 to our attention here at CHCF. And I thought if maybe Patty could speak for a couple moments on um, how the plan is uh, thinking about using uh, the Spirometry 360 program um, with the practices that they work with. Patty? Hey, thank, you. thank you, Sophia. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Okay. Uh, thank you for uh, inviting me to speak briefly today. I am uh, from Partnership Health Plan of California, which is a Medi-Cal managed care plan um, sort of sandwiched between Sacramento and um, San Francisco serving six counties. We have about 200,000 lives. Um, in a recent review of our HEDIS data, uh, looking at our scores specifically for spirometry, we recognize fully that our practices aren't quite up to par. Looking around at different opportunities to assist our practices to improve uh, spirometry, not only for our COPD patients and asthma patients, um, we became well aware of, and I actually have a, pre a previous history with Jim's group um, that does this very unique training. Uh, we, um, in assessing our opportunities for improvement, we uh, spoke with our providers about what they felt their barriers were to improving adherence to the guidelines specifically as it relates to using spirometry for the um, diagnosis and management of patients with respiratory diseases. They told us, as I'm sure many of you, that the lack of comfort doing the test and the lack of confidence with interpreting the test were largely the reasons why they don't do this in the primary care setting. Um, so what we did with some uh, support from the California Healthcare Foundation and a very committed uh, chief medical officer is we approached five practices in our setting, uh, in, our, in our region, actually, with some assistance from Jim and his group in terms of the selection criteria. Um, and we now are involved in Jim's spring cohort. We have three uh, family practice, uh, practices involved, uh, one with uh, a, a clinician champion and three, excuse me, two coaches from each of those sites, as well as two nurse practitioners who are a part of our home visiting uh, team. They see a lot of our COPD patients, um, homebound uh, patients who are not able to, uh, to go to the clinic. Um, we are uh, in four, we're in the fourth session. We just completed the fourth of the five uh, training sessions. Um, our providers are hugely satisfied. I was speaking to a primary care physician this morning who described Tim, uh, Jim's team and the practice, the training as well organized, nicely paced, highly interactive, convenient, and um, really complement the expert faculty that Jim and his team bring to the phone every time. Um, they believe that this training will help their practice not only to um, improve the quality of the test, but actually also improve the quality of the diagnosis and management of those patients with those uh, chronic diseases. Thank you. I am surprised that we're not getting questions. Are you guys getting questions that are going to you, Greg and Jim, that I'm not seeing? Uh, not yet. I well, don't think I'm so, ask, Sylvia. I'm going to ask the obvious question, which some people may have, which is, well, this is great, but they're assuming it's not for free, so you want to talk a little bit more about how you would participate? About the, you mean pricing structure and that sort of thing? Yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, we, 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 license, um, we license the intervention. You're right, that is sort of obviously missing from this presentation, Sophia, and I <laughs> wasn't quite sure what to do about that. We, um, the license fee for the course is about $1,500 um, for your practice, and that, that includes the, basically all the resources we discussed, both the training itself, the feedback reports, spirometry fundamentals, and then one-on-one -on -one help as, as needed. Um, it's, a, it's less than that uh, for early registration with an NDD device because um, it's just basically less expensive for us labor-wise to, to um, produce the course with the NDD than it is with other machines. Um, the specifics of that are available on our, um, there's a, a fall flyer, <coughs> and um, perhaps I should have made that one of the slides, Sophia, but it's very easy to get to from our homepage if you go to the um, spirometrytraining.org, and then that top white box, it says, um, you know, click here for our fall flyer, and it's a fairly busy flyer because it um, does a lot of what we did today on the phone, makes the case, describes the components, um, but also lists the different webinars and, and the times they occur on both our coast and the East Coast, um, and, uh, and then the pricing structure. And uh, I'm also, Karen and I are always happy to, to sort of answer questions if people have, have them after um, looking those materials over. And I guess the other question is, is you, know, I, I, you know, you've trained over 300 practices, and so I'm curious to get a sense of how many of those practices, for example, were either sponsored through some type of a grant or research project. Clearly, in the case of the five practices that, pa that Partnership Health Plan right. is working with, the plan is actually, um, uh, Pat, are you guys fully paying for the course for them? Uh, yes, it has been fully paid. Um, so, you know, then, then you just get to sign up. And so do you have a sense of the distribution of how that participation has been paid for in the practices you've dealt with so far? Yeah, that's a great question, Sophia. Probably, oh, I, I, we'd have to count to be sure, but I would guess about two-thirds of practices have had the course subsidized in one way or another. Um, we have a large randomized trial going on right now, um, and for which we provided both the spirometer and the training um, to 50 pediatric practices around the country. And we're just now training the control group after they waited an entire intervention year. Um, uh, the NACI program through uh, NHLBI, that stands for National Asthma Control Initiative, sponsored over two years, they sponsored um, 30 licenses for safety net practices, which enabled us to get into um, many practice communities that we couldn't otherwise. We've had a couple of state societies that partially subsidize the course. Um, Virginia um, Physician Foundation, um, I think, uh, pays two-thirds of the um, tuition and then ask the practices to, to sort of make up the balance for the, the final 500 or so. And then a number of practices, frankly most of them um, from the New York community that we originally trained um, and then in, in Washington State just people that know of us and um, have, have just, you know, had private practices sign up and, and participate that way. Um, I should also mention I, uh, we had a paper come out about a week ago um, looking at our first test of this full intervention, and um, it's in academic pediatrics, and I'm the first author, and it's entitled Learning from a Distance. And although it's, it's pediatric specific, I think the principles in there are generalizable to any primary care office. Um, Jim, I just, I just wanted to add a little bit about the cost, and because in primary care, uh, with my travels, it's always been an issue that has uh, first arisen, and, and not only the cost of a course like this, but the cost of the equipment itself. But again, I, I think that uh, it's the right thing to do. I think those of us in primary care have relied upon our clinical skills all too often to manage asthma and COPD, and, and it's become very clear now that uh, we're not, not always right. I think that uh, truly the, the cost of the equipment and or a course uh, are uh, quickly uh, uh, realized and accounted for by uh, taking care of patients correctly, keeping them out of the emergency rooms and hospitals. And I think it particularly is important when you start talking about managed care when the goal is not only to provide excellent care for your patients, but to keep those cost outliers under control, of course, ER and, and hospitalizations. And Jim, how much does that spirometer that syncs with your system cost? How much does that 
It's um, somewhere between um, $1,500 and $2,000. And, uh, and then there's an ongoing sort of low-grade cost of mouthpieces, which cost between a dollar and two, depending on how many you buy and, and who you buy them from. Um, uh, depending on your practice environment, this may or may not be a reimbursable procedure. I know uh, Medi-Cal is different from Medicaid in Washington State. Here we can bill for it, but I know in many of the California capitated systems, that's an issue. So, um, and that's a real that's a real issue. I don't know if there's folks on the phone that are impacted by that um, and and that have that factor into their decision making. But as Greg mentioned, if you um, are in a typical fee for service uh, system, even in a safety net setting, you quickly pay for the the procedure and the training and the and the device. Right. If you're if it's a reimbursable procedure. Right. Patty, do you have anything else you want to add? Um, yeah, I would just add that one of the incentives for providers, as Jim alluded to, is that MOC um, uh, certification you receive as a part of that. I was talking to a family physician this morning who said this is just a great way to not only you know get the experience with quality improvement, but um, it certainly uh, meets that uh, requirement uh, quite easily. Well, it's great. and and. I'm surprised that our participants are so mum. I suspect it's because you've been so thorough and wonderful in your presentation that it's very <laughs> clear. Um, what I'd yeah, like to ask you. Yeah, busy eating their lunch. <laughs> yeah, but they can eat. They can, you can eat in type too. But um, <laughs> what I'll ask you to do is uh, maybe provide us um, either a, a PDF of the flyer or the link, as well as the citation that you mentioned that recently um, sure. was released. And what I'll do is I'll add that to your slide set, which does which will get posted. And just a reminder to everyone, um, I'm going to be wrapping up, but if someone wants to throw in a question, they're welcome to while I speak here. Um, this is where the uh, recording of today's presentation will be posted, chcf.org slash CIN. Uh, and that usually is up within the week, sometimes earlier, but I usually say a week because then we know that we will actually meet that timeline. Uh, and with that, I am going to thank Jim, Greg, and Patty for speaking with our audience today because I think this is, frankly, a very interesting and great program. I think it's an example of many places where we can really develop data-driven processes in our clinical care. And so um, I'm excited that Partnership Health Plan has adopted this, or at least is testing it, and we'll be looking forward to hearing from them about how they feel the test is going and, um, and what they learn from it and whether or not they're going to spread this further. And perhaps they, that might be the topic of yet another webinar. Uh, and uh, thank you, everyone. Anything else? So, thanks, Sophia, again for the chance, and I, I appreciate everyone that stayed on the line. Um, we're available for questions, and as soon as we get off the phone, Sophia, I will send you um, that publication and the and the PDF of the fall course. That would be great. Thank you, everyone, and have a wonderful afternoon. Thanks again. Thanks again. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thanks, Patty. Oh, you're welcome. Mm-hmm. <laughs>